This week we veer into the world of sports science, which has increasingly become the frontier battleground of professional sports, but is dangerous territory for a simple hack to tread on. Which is why we have brought in Dr. Mike Postumus, a respected voice in the field of sports science and a professional athlete himself. Mike is the head of the high performance at the Sports Science Institute in South Africa and an honorary senior researcher in the Department of Exercise Science and Sports Medicine at UCT, among many other accolades. Morning, Mike. Welcome. Morning, Craig. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is a, a big field. I mean, sports science, we, you know, where do you start, where do you end? But you're a pro athlete as well. Let's just get that out there. You've ridden well, the... try and be. <laughs> you, try and... <laughs> well, you've ridden the Cape Epic uh, five times. You came 24th one year. I mean, that puts you in fairly good company, doesn't it? Oh, I try. <laughs> <laughs> now, first of all, sports science. Maybe for our listeners, what's, what's the broad concept of sports science? Well, if we could define it simply for a, for a listener out there. Well, I consider myself as somebody that when working with athletes, I apply the science. So obviously there's a lot of science and sports science can be anything from lab-based, really finer details of biochemistry and microbiology, all to um, more applied sciences. But a sports scientist is somebody that takes all of that knowledge and applies it to an athlete. So there's a lot that we could apply everything from a finer details of what happens within a muscle that on a molecular level and really applying that to training modalities within an athlete or within a team. How many athletes share deep interest in, in, in that level of detail? Because I'd imagine you have some guys who really want to go right down to the molecular level and understand their, how their muscles work. And there's other guys who just, doc, just tell me how many push-ups to do to, to be good. <laughs> exactly. Spot on. You do have some that do try and understand. And then, then you have some that say, just tell me what to do. So being a coach myself as well, it is sort of managing those personalities too and, and getting to know the individual and, and finding what works best for each individual. And knowing that for, for you, I might need to explain the finer details for you to be be more compliant to a program or training session where others just tell them what to do and they're happy yeah now you can't see mike but now mike's quite a tall guy probably what six foot one thereabouts no, and one uh, eight five, I yeah think. Uh, and he weighs 85 kilos lean as you'd imagine but quite muscular but he was a semi-professional loose head prop weighing in at 120 kilos a few years ago so it's an amazing transition you've sort of the living embodiment in some ways of of the benefits of sports science using you were a prop you played high level of rugby you needed a certain muscle mass to perform that function as a prop you need strength weight all those things as a cyclist you need a different body shape and you and you've you've got there yeah, so I've, I've always been interested in sports science. I started off studying a, a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical, Molecular and Cellular Sciences. And after that, I went across the Sports Science Institute where I did honours in exercise science and then did a PhD in exercise science. So it's always been something I'm extremely passionate about. Obviously, as a rugby player, I also didn't start off as a prop. So I first started off as a as a loose forward. Right. Um, actually, by absolute chance, um, a coach put me in the front row because of a few injuries. I managed to cope and he said, well, can you you put on 20 kilograms so I had to put on 20 kilograms to be able to handle the pressures of being in the front row and I had a few years then a successful few years playing loose head prop um, once I'd hung up my boots in 2010 I then went for a ride with a few mates and then got completely hooked by the sport of mountain biking and then soon realized that I can't be carrying all this excess yeah. weight up and down a mountain so then I sort of underwent this um could call it a transformation trying to lose weight to be as efficient as possible on the mountain bike and obviously performance is very closely linked to your weight because performance on the bicycle is measured in watts per kilogram right. so if you are going to be heavier you need to put out more watts there are only so many watts you can put out so you have to lose weight to be able to climb better and I mean, being a sports scientist, you must have had a great interest in how you were doing that because you don't want to lose strength or stamina while doing that. So was it a balancing act? Yes, it was a balancing act. And initially, I, I really... I struggle to, or I do still struggle, it's a constant struggle to try and lose weight. I'm still way heavier than anybody I race against. Mm. So it is still a constant challenge. So obviously I I use my knowledge again to try and play around with different modalities to see how most effectively I can lose weight. And I had to, of course, lose muscle mass. So it is losing the correct muscle mass, yeah. um, specifically in my upper body. I've had to try deliberately to 
to actually try and lose muscle mass in my upper body, try and not carry heavy objects. <laughs> it's, it's a reality. And actually try and sometimes... Sorry, honey, I can't take out the trash. Too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> can't carry the groceries. <laughs> but yeah, that um, <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah. Well, and, and, but I, I suppose that leads us into some sort of aspects of sports science where you said you had to, when you first moved to property, you had to pick up 20 kilos. Now, rugby is one of those sports where sports science is quite prominent so you would have had to do very specific training to pick up 20 kilos of muscle you could probably eat and pick it up in fat but that's not really going to help you as an athlete so you you had to do that then you had to lose it again and and we know from rugby things like creatine are are legal so Mm -hmm. guys can build muscle mass through the use of creatine and and then there's lots of illegal things so how did you go about sort of putting on 20 kilos and 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 that experience has it played into your work later down the line well, it's yeah. When when trying to put on muscle mass, there really is no no shortcuts. You mm. need to train hard and you need to eat. And I recall back from those days, I used to train days I wasn't practicing on the rugby field. I used to gym twice a day. Um, used to pick up really really heavy weights to try and stimulate the muscle growth. And I used to eat mm. lots of <laughs> I protein. Can, I can only think about the the amount of protein. Probably what I know now it was probably excessive, but I used to eat a lot of protein and a lot of calories as well to be able to stimulate the muscle growth. Yeah, we have these lines in sport. You know, age, weight, gender. So there's categories in in all sports, and and I guess from a sports science point of view, it's it's quite an interesting debate about categories about weight. Do you think, for instance, schoolboy rugby, uh, should we go weight divisions, or because age groups are fairly arbitrary, you can have two 15 year olds and they could be 30 kilograms apart in in weight. So, do you think that something like rugby would benefit more from a, a weight category rather than an age category within a certain band of age? I would imagine you couldn't have a nine year old and a 16 year old. Even if they were the same weight, I don't think that would work. But generally speaking, do you think the weight category is a bit slightly better way of looking at things? There has been a lot of research done in this field, and I've worked closely with with the guys from SA Rugby, um, Clint Reddit and um, Wayne Fulyun from mm. Boxmart, and they have investigated the possibilities, and it has been trialed, specifically in other countries, it's been trialed in New Zealand. There are pros and cons to both sides of the argument. There are some pros in which say that uh, playing simply in age categories are better versus others that that try and match size. So obviously match size might decrease the risk of some injuries, but you then have to remember that if you do put in a very large younger child with older, more mature t- mature children you might increase his risk of injury simply Mm. because he is not as mature and his musculoskeletal system is not as mature so i'm just trying to illustrate that it is not it's not that simple it's not always that simple um weight is one issue but skeletal maturity um psychological maturity these are all factors that need to be considered so it's not an easy decision how much psychology do you consider uh, when you, you know, in sports science? Because when I think of sports science, I just think of the physiology of it rather than than the mental aspect. But do you consider you know, psychology and, and, and the mental aspect of it too in your field? Completely, yeah. Very, very big component. So we, we often speak, and and again, I can just talk to some of the, the athletes I coach who work with cyclists, and the psychological component is huge. And I would say within elite sports, it's more than 50% Mm. of performance. So you can have the most gifted physiology and be as strong as possible. But if your mind isn't able to, you're not going to win a race. Yeah. If we think about the top elite road cycling competition, the Tour de France, um, no matter how strong you are, if, if you aren't mentally strong, you are not going to be competitive. Mm. So the the mental game is critically important. And I've used cycling as an example, but across all sports. Yeah. And we see it time and time again. I mean, you, you can you can watch a golf tournament and Two guys have a similar putt. You know, the one guy misses on a high pressure situation, the other guy doesn't, and that doesn't come down to the fact that they can't play the game. It comes down to something between the ears, doesn't In it? In practice, anybody can do it. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that is where the mental game becomes critically important. Well, it brings us nicely onto the old ten thousand hour. <laughs> <laughs> and I know a lot of sports scientists hate Malcolm Gladwell for bringing out that ten thousand hour thing. Um, yeah, well, just for our listeners, you know, he Malcolm Gladwell's an author, and he claims that uh, through a book he wrote that ten thousand hours of anything you'll become really good at it if not you know excellent at it and 
I've never believed it's quite that simple because I'm sure I could do 10,000 hours of, I don't know, boxing and I'll never become a great boxer. It's just not inside me. And, and, and so where does that sort of nature versus nurture argument fit in with sports science? So, uh, so firstly, it was actually Professor Erickson who had first said that 10,000 hours is all you need to reach an elite performance. However, that argument, which is practice will get you there, completely excludes genetics. And this is actually my background and my PhD was actually in genetics of sports science. So it is something sort of close to home. You can't exclude genetics. So everybody is individual and everybody is completely different and everybody responds different to exercise. You've got some that respond very well to exercise, some that don't respond very yeah. well to exercise. There's even been some studies that have shown that you get non-responders to exercise. So those are people that undergo an exercise regime and actually get worse. Wow. So, um, <laughs> that must so be people, demoralized. <laughs> exactly. So people don't respond the same. So you can't give a blanket and say, if you do 10,000 hours, you're going to reach expert level. It's mm. not that simple. So reaching a certain performance level is a combination of both. It's called nature, nurture, both your genetics and your training, if you want to simplify down to those two factors within yeah. nature, nurture. So it is both. So you can't reach top level performance without, and I can simplify it by saying the correct genetics. Yeah. You also can't reach top level performance without training. Yeah. So you need both. Yeah. So I, as far as I'm concerned, it's not even a debate. It is very, very simple. You need both. You can't um, do it with just nature. You can't do it with just nurture. You need nature mm -hmm. and nurture. The, the greatest long distance and middle distance athlete, athletes come from East Africa, generally speaking, is, uh, and a few from North Africa for a reason. I mean, you know, those guys weigh 55 kilos and have certain muscle fiber and, you know, you and I could go and try and be uh, long distance athletes and we could do the 10,000 hours. We're never going to get there mm. to that level. We mm. will get better within our own sphere and again in that example again they've got the nature clearly they've got good genetics but they've also had the nurture sure. they grew up running if you go and have a look at their competitions and how they train you know they are in the correct environments and a lot of other athletes can learn about those environments those athletes are in so again it's a it's a combination there yeah, so many sports around the world. I mean, rugby, for instance, is is big in in the Afrikaans community for per, as uh, for example. So kids playing, it's part of their culture. They play rugby in Britain, you know, wherever, Brazil, it's football. It's part of the culture. So yes, you, you have certain athletic gifts, but you're surrounded by that that sport or that pastime all the time is that is that another massive component to it yeah exposure yeah. Yeah. is a huge contributing factor to to performance the earlier you're exposed to a sport and all those kids would have grown up watching rugby as children next to the rugby field passing balls around they would have been exposed to the sport from a young age and they would have started playing the sport as a young age and that exposure obviously contributes to again that nurture required to reach top level that with a good set of genetics, as often we see in those communities, yeah. is, is a recipe for success. On that subject, but you're a father, and mm -hmm. so we're veering off a little bit here, but do you feel that as the kids get older, we're seeing very specific, you're going to play rugby from the age of 12, you know, and a kid just plays rugby from 12, doesn't do multiple mm -hmm. sports. Do, do you feel that multiple sports, we're talking just purely sporting, yeah, are, are vital to a child's sort of development where they can find the right sport they, they should participate in many things what you're specifically talking to is what we call early specialization and yeah. there's been a big debate as well whether early specialization is good or not and there's a host of host of um, evidence saying that early specialization number one is not required and number two is not beneficial so to really simplify some of the science what you want to do with youngsters and kids playing sports is have them play a diverse set of sports have them develop multiple abilities and then only specialize much later mm. and the benefits is far greater compared to early specialization where you pick one sport from a young age and only play that sport so unfortunately we we always get thrown these anecdotes of early specialization and why that's so good and there there are various examples tiger woods well i was going to say tiger woods is one isn't he He's yeah no, and and this is actually a debate very well illustrated if this is something you're interested in to go and look up david epstein's um, latest book called range in which he discusses all of this and the right. evidence for early specialization i highly recommend the book a great read yeah. uh, but but again he really debunks that this early specialization 
Early, <laughs> it's a real tongue twister. Yeah. Early specialization is required. Yeah. And his whole book and theory, I say theory, but really a summary of the peer-reviewed literature out there, is that having a greater range is more beneficial. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen, you, you take an A.B. de Villiers, for example. I mean, he's the classic sort of guy who played Craven Week fly-off, was a scratch golfer at 16. He was, Herschel uh, yeah, Gibbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah Herschel yeah. Gibbs, uh, amazing athlete. So, you know, those guys... Probably they did eventually find their their niche, but uh, they showed that there's a you know you can do a lot of things and be good at them, <laughs> and then you can specialize when you're ready. Um, yeah, and I, I, guess, I suppose there's a lot more pressure these days, isn't there? Professional sport has certainly exploded in the last twenty years in this mm-hmm. country, particularly. So if you want to make it into a rugby academy or a cricket, get a cricket contract or a football contract. You've got to be catching the attention of these people at 14 or something. And that does put pressure on kids to specialize, doesn't it? Hmm. In, incorrectly so. It does put pressure on. But I do feel, however, that the unions, the provinces, the sporting federations actually need to be wiser as well and need to realize that they need to look look outside of their sports or need to identify pathways in which they can pick up extremely good athletes that might not have been early specialization or that might not have early specialized. We had Gary Gold on a few months mm. ago, the USA rugby coach, and he was saying what they're looking at. I, I thought the natural instinct would be to look at American football mm. and try and find rugby players. And he says, no, they're looking at basketball players because they have height and they have strength and they also have amazing athleticism. So basketball players seem to, where they're going to start recruiting some youngsters to become rugby players. So, you know, perfect you, example. It is. And I never really considered basketball players, mm. but when you stop to think about it, Someone like Achir Sneeman in a different environment could have been a hell of a basketball player at six foot nine and a great athlete, couldn't he? So there are crossovers. But talking about rugby, the Springboks at the World Cup, they were fitter with Alad Walters coming on board. They did very specific situational training, they called it. They wanted more men on their feet to get into the tackle line, fewer attended rucks. So the ball was in play for longer periods, kick chase, they were doing a lot more running. Uh, there was, you know, they didn't move from one set piece to the other, and and they changed their whole the whole body shape and their structure. They got leaner. They were lost a few kilos here and there. The forwards. Um, how impressive was that for you as a sports scientist to see that sort of metamorphosis of the Springbok team over two years? By the time they almost peaked at the World Cup. Yeah, no, obviously v- very impressive. But um, j- just going back a few years, I've I've always found generally within rugby players they've always had the ability to be fitter. They've always had the ability to be leaner and be better athletes. Mm. Really, if you compare rugby play, and quite often I talk back 10 years and from when I played and even before I played, um, within rugby circles and rugby strength and conditioning, because you're not an individual sportsman, you know, your your individual strength and conditioning would always be less important and I always felt that athletes could get a lot fitter when really embodying being full professional athletes and I'm really really glad that we are now starting to see athletes especially rugby players really becoming well-rounded athletes there's no more excuse for a front row player to be carrying excess body fat yeah for example so previously there was a great push for for athletes to be heavier especially front row players they were told that to be 120 kilograms nobody would pick somebody that isn't 120 kilograms Um, and now we are seeing athletes actually over rugby players being better athletes being leaner stronger faster and really happy to see this and and um, well done to the springbok team and their strength and conditioning team in getting the best out of these players and without a doubt that is why we won the world cup Mm. we were better conditioned and we have really embodied what what athletes need to be to perform at the top level absolutely and it it shone right through that that whole campaign and uh, liverpool football club is another one they're dominating the english premier league this year under jürgen klopp they play a very high tempo high pressing game where that requires a lot of movement a lot of um yeah each player runs a lot of kilometers at high intensity they had a lot of minor muscle injuries in the first year he was there and i've read a lot about this and they changed fitness coach they changed ideas the players had to get used to the regime have you sort of encountered a similar thing in sports you've you've worked with yeah so to translate that to sports science what we talk about here is real athlete monitoring and 
you can't simply increase the load on a player, especially in the, if I have to talk soccer specifically, it is the high velocity runs and duration spent in those high velocity training zones. You can't just increase that and then not have a consequence. So initially, as you illustrated there, the consequence was increased injuries. You would start seeing increased hamstring strains, etc. And really what you want to do there from an athlete monitoring perspective is to then monitor and actually get feedback from the athlete, record their subjective feelings, their subjective wellness, their training loads, their high risk activities such as the high velocity sprints, etc. And try and find the perfect balance between not training them too hard and not training them too little. Mm. Um, so you need that monitoring and that feedback to be able to alter their training load to get the best out of them. Now, if you say that, again, I'm not speaking about your example, but if I have to explain uh, your example from a sports science perspective, if they were pushed too much, they would have gotten the injuries yeah. and if they found their balance what they are able to sustain they would be able to reach their optimal level of performance so that's obviously what their sports science team were able to calculate within mm. their team setting what exactly what loads they are required to reach their optimal level so obviously they they had a lot of learnings mm. from year one and well done to their sports science team through learning um, getting the feedback changing the load for the subsequent years and obviously their success currently is largely attributed to their sports science interventions. Yeah, I mean, it's taken them a few years to get there, but they've got there in the end. One of the things that strikes me about, say, Liverpool, but all, all sports teams, they play over months and months and, you know, how do they maintain that level for so long? Because like all human beings, we have ups and downs. You get sick, guys have flu, and they never see – you sort of see the same team going out every week if you're watching Liverpool for, for, as an example. And you go, well, this week, you know, it's about the 10th week in a row Mo, Mo Salah is playing. Does he not feel fatigued? Does he not have a cold every now and again? You know, how do you sort of manage that, that performance level consistently at, at, at elite level? Well – Firstly, you have to break down and their sports science team, if I have to use them as an example again, would have in the beginning of the season actually developed a periodized program. Every single week they would have an objective within every single week. They would know exactly when their competitions are. And that periodization program would help and be developed to protect the athletes too. So they would have had a specific period of building um, traditionally base phase and then would have gone into sort of higher speed runs or greater intensity. And then within this periodization program, they would of course have certain rest weeks, which they would deload the players to ensure that they are fully recovered. So you might only see the players at their top end fitness, but there was a long build up into that. And there are continuous periods of strain and rest, strain and rest to ensure that they are able to maintain the level of performance we see them at on this field. Mm. Um, so obviously that cannot be sustained. The playing week in week out and there will generally be an off season or period of rest where they will be recuperating and if there's a prolonged period like an off season or period of mid season they will then include some some build work to be able to get back up to a certain level to be able to sustain the the, the matches that happen weekly mm. but um what we don't see is the work that goes on behind the scenes and the rest between the hard work to ensure that their bodies are able to catch up and recover. Yeah, and rest is this one issue. I know years ago <clears throat> with, um, I think Professor Tim Noakes was one of the early, and he, he probably worked under him or certainly yeah. studied some of his material. Um, he was a big advocate for that players needed three three months, 12 weeks consecutive rest. I'm talking rugby yeah, mm -hmm. between seasons. That was the initial diagnosis. I don't know if we still believe in that these days because uh, – very seldom, this last season was unusual because the Curry Cup ended very early and so the players did actually have, a, a, those not involved at the Springboks at the World Cup had a very long break. But generally speaking, there's hardly a 12-week period where rugby players can get 12 weeks consecutive rest or active rest as they call it. Is that theory still out there? Very much so. It's a common problem in professional sports. As soon as a sport becomes professional, seasons end up being 11 months. Mm. This is something we see in cycling, it's something we see in rugby, we see it in a lot of sports that rest period is still critically important. Players need some time off, 
both from a physiological and a psychological yeah. perspective. To be able to maintain top-level performance, you need the psychological break. Your body needs the break as well, which is the physiological break, to build up that freshness to be able to train hard again and build up to to that level of performance i talked about mm. in the periodization cycle so it's a constant challenge for people like you in the, with teams if they're not getting that 12 weeks they might only get six weeks break you as the sports science <laughs> scientist in the team has to somehow make it work Yes, 100%. Mm. You, you do have to keep on reminding coaches and athletes that that break, complete break and rest is important. It doesn't all have to be sitting on a couch. Mm. Generally within, within teams, we would try and get a small sort of, if I can get two to three weeks of sitting on a couch, I'll be happy. But then you want sort of active rest, get them more active and then start preparing for the next season again. But we certainly can't be playing rugby matches for 11 months of the year. Yeah. Yeah. And your your favorite sport, cycling. Maybe we could step into slightly controversial territory. Uh, it's had a huge, uh, at professional level, this huge drug problem. And we, you know, we can go through all the names and the, you know, Lance Armstrong being the most high profile one, but it's a constant ball and chain around it. Do you think cycling will ever shed this, this problem? Uh, given the physical demands on athletes, do you think cycling can ever realistically completely get away from its stigma? Um, I think currently I wouldn't say the stigma is good, but we require the stigma to ensure that the sport remains clean because 100%, I can't say everybody is clean currently in mm. the pro peloton and, and front of the pack in local races and also back of the pack. So you said elite athletes, it's a problem throughout. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is that I can say without a doubt that cycling at the moment is cleaner than what it was years back. Right. And the reason it is cleaner is because of these pressures. So currently athletes are being tested and testing is using intelligence in saying that athletes are targeted. So we know that testing is happening and testing has been robust or certainly more robust than it has been in the past. Mm. Although I can't say with certainty that it's 100% clean, well, no one it's can. a lot no. cleaner than it used to be. Yeah. And that to me is positive and that to me is a result of the, the pressures put on cyclists and specifically um, our local SAIDs, who's our local um, anti-doping commission, um, they are specifically targeting cyclists, trying to detect it and being more proactive yeah. in their methodology as well as their approaches in trying to catch cyclists. So I'm very confident that it is a lot cleaner and I like the pressure and, and I think there should be continued pressure on the sport because it is so bloody hard. Mm -hmm. It is a sport that is always going to have athletes try and push the limits yeah. so it's great that there is this pressure on the athletes now talking about pushing limits technology not your field but we take someone like marathon runners and we've just seen kipchoge break the two-hour marathon a few months back again i know this is not your field but the nike vapor fly shoe has become one of those things like the speedo swimsuit from <laughs> the early 2000s how how big a role does technology play in these in these kind of record attempts rather than just your average race where guys are trying to compete each other, where they're trying to beat a clock? Is this the new frontier that we've got to watch out for in some ways? Of course, but I don't know how to watch out for it. So it it is evolution and it's and it's very tricky. And I'm not very close to the running shoe debate. I know it's it's very controversial, as was the swimsuits a few years ago. But in cycling, for example, and I keep on bouncing back yeah, to cycling. Fine. Um we've seen if 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 we just compare times up certain climbs, we know there's been a an evolution of riders becoming faster, even though we do believe that they are cleaner. That again is technology. The technology in cycling and in bicycles is absolutely huge. Everything from carbon bicycle frames to the technology going into carbon wheels to the aerodynamics within bicycle helmets. Yeah. It's continuously evolving. So I don't know how you are ever going to draw the line into saying what evolution is allowed and what evolution is not allowed. Mm. To me, you've just got to be able to find something that is black and white and draw that line as to when it actually becomes dangerous. Yeah. So within cycling, there's a limit to how light your, your bicycle can be. So well, that's very clear. Yeah. That's, that, that's very clear because you can't ride something too light because 
it might become dangerous riding a bicycle that is too light. So there's a reason behind that cutoff and mm. that relates directly to technology because technology could potentially get that lighter. Some cyclists have to add weight to their bikes to be able to get their bikes over the limit wow. because their bicycles are so light. But that to me makes sense because it associates with risk. Yeah. I don't know how you're going to do it within other sports. And and again, I'm, I'm just watching with interest as to how the athletic community is going to handle the shoe debate. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we can go back at Cinder Tracks 50 years ago and then Tartan Tracks. So they're faster, just naturally. Yes. That's technology, right? So, uh, And then the spikes have always developed. And in motor racing, engines have got better and tires have got better. And, you know, we can – any sport, cricket bats are thicker and yes. better. Now, golf clubs are, are, are better. You know, golf ball technology has changed. Tennis racket strings and rackets have changed. So it's an evolution, as you say. Yeah. It's almost unstoppable short of the human powering it or, or using it yes. remains you know, that line. And every sport's got to find whatever that line is. Exactly. You know? yeah. and, and specifically within athletics now, the debate is that it increases your economy by X percent. But running shoes have always tried to achieve that. So they've always only given 1% or 2% now suddenly because they're reaching closer to the 4%. Now suddenly there's an issue. Mm. So it, it, it is very hard to draw that line. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the running shoe, you've still got to run. It's not as long as it doesn't have a motor in it or some sort of springs. I don't know some sort of artificial device. The guy wearing them still got to actually put one foot in front of the other. And, and again, do those it's types. quite nice me commenting because I'm not into it. But you touched on it there where you said spring, and I guess that's part of the debate. Yeah, as well. I suppose as, as, as I said when, it, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> when does the w w when does the return of the energy actually set off that cutoff? We'll have to get someone in from Nike in to uh, give us a breakdown of that at some point. But. Uh, there's a lot of fascinating issues. I mean, I'd love to get into a few more, but uh, gender in sports is another issue. We have categories, male, female, um, for, for reasons. Um, physiologically, where do you sit on this sort of debate? Because there's a lot of debate about male and female sports, and male sport does get a lot more attention than female sport, and, yes. and that's unfortunate. But uh, is, it, is it a sort of a condition because people are, perceive it's better? Because a guy can run 9. Seven five seconds, and a, and and a lady can only run ten point seven five seconds. So we as humans obviously get get attracted to bigger, faster, stronger. But in certain sports, and again, using cycling example, female cycling is far more exciting than male cycling. And I follow the cross country discipline in mountain biking, and just following the female cross country racing is far more exciting than the male cross country racing. You know, and I believe that we need to do more in marketing female sport mm. um, to be able to illustrate exactly that. Yeah. Sometimes the emotions captured, the competitiveness, the closeness of the racing sometimes can make for a, a far better spectacle than some of the male competition. It's a fascinating debate. Yeah, it certainly is. And Mike, it's been great having you on the Maverick Sports Podcast. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. This podcast is made possible by our Maverick Insiders. Please consider becoming part of our Maverick Insider community where, for a nominal fee every month, you are supporting quality independent journalism. You also get some cool benefits such as Uber vouchers and engagement with our journalists thrown in. Please go to dailymaverick.co.za forward slash insider to sign up and become part of the Maverick Insider community. Also remember to sign up to our Maverick Sports newsletter, which hits your inbox on a Monday and never miss another podcast by signing up via your favorite platform. I'm Craig Ray and thanks for joining us this week. Yeah.